Hi everybody! If you have taken any physics classes in your life, you must have encountered typical problems of a body on an inclined plane, ball on a ramp, object falling from a cliff, or a ball bouncing. As with most imaginary problems, you would assume ideal conditions. No friction, vacuum, perfectly elastic collisions, and so on. Well, recently I have encountered all these problems in a real-world example and I would like to share it with you. I've got the idea while playing around with my new speed light. And this idea developed into a full-scale physics experiment. A typical external flash unit, or speed light, essentially has two modes of operation firing once, or firing multiple times. If you look around, you will find many videos explaining how to operate a speed light, focusing in detail on various settings in the single flash mode. However, very often they will skip the multi-flash mode as rarely used or advanced. This immediately triggered me to think of a situation in which I could employ the multi-flash mode and I came up with the idea of a bouncing ball. So in order to deploy the ball in a more or less reproducible way, I have prepared a small setup consisting of a wooden rail to guide the ball and a music stand with an adjustable height and angle. I have set up the exposure length, that is the shutter speed, long enough so there is enough time for the ball to get from the top of the stand to the end of the table. I have adjusted the intensity, the number and the frequency of the flashes such that the ball leaves a nice trail. To be completely honest, I did not have much choice in setting those parameters as the number and the intensity of the flashes are coupled. You can get one full intensity flash every few seconds and to get many consecutive flashes you have to lower the intensity towards the minimum. Furthermore, to trace the ball from the first to the last point the ratio of number of flashes and their frequency must stay constant. Finally, I have set the aperture and the ISO such that the background is not overexposed with respect to the ball. And here is the result. I hope you have enjoyed these shots, because now we are diving into the physics part. The first step is to choose the photo to analyze, and ideally that would be the photo that captured the ball position in crucial moments which constrained the calculation. The photo that I have chosen contains two important ball positions. The first one is where the ball is about to leave the ramp, and the second one where the ball is touching the table. The ball is also captured in the position almost at the top of the parabola of the first bounce. It also looks like I have managed to release it just as the first flash fired. The second step is to establish the coordinate system and for that I have used a program called GeoGebra which allowed me to later on plot the equations of motion. I have set the lower left corner of the image in the origin of the coordinate system and I have adjusted the size of the photo such that the length of the ramp measures 29 centimeters, as it does in reality. Then I have determined the position of the ball using the circles constructed from the center point and the radius. From there, I could proceed with determining the angle of the incline and its height, as well as the height of the ramp with respect to the table. So now we have all the numbers needed to start the calculation. Let's for now approximate the air and the rolling resistance to zero and assume that the ball is rolling without slipping. At first, the ball rolls along the ramp from position P1, where we assume its velocity is zero, to P8, where we will approximate that the ball leaves the ramp and starts falling. In order to describe the free fall of the ball, we need its velocity in P8. We can determine that from the energy relation. The kinetic energy of the ball 
at the bottom of the incline must be equal to the potential energy at the top. Therefore, we have the following relation as the ball is both moving and rotating around its axis. As the ball is rolling without slipping, the angular velocity omega equals to v over r. To calculate the moment of inertia we use the formula for the hollow sphere, where we are missing the value of the inner radius of the ball. Unfortunately, to determine its value, one ball had to be sacrificed. With this last missing value, we can rearrange the equation to get the expression for the velocity. And finally, after putting in the numbers, we get v8 equals 1.13 meters per second. Now we can move to the second part of the calculation. The free fall of the ball in the air can be described by the motion equations written here. As in the photo we are not looking at the space-time graph, but at y as a function of x, let's get rid of the time by combining the two equations. What we get is a quadratic formula which we can plot. Hmm... It looks like the ball did not hit the table where it was supposed to. From the formula we can see that there are basically two things that could have gone wrong. Either we got wrong the angle of the ramp, or we got wrong the velocity in the point P8. Given that the ramp angle is based on the direct measurement and a simple geometry, I would be more inclined to believe that some of the assumptions in the velocity calculation do not hold. In particular, we assumed no rolling resistance, which for sure is not true, although we do not know the magnitude of that effect. Therefore, let's assume for the moment that only the calculated velocity is incorrect, and let's try to see by how much we got it wrong. So instead of using calculated velocity value, I am now using the value given by this slider. You can see that as I change the ball speed, the parabolic trajectory also changes. The optimal value seems to be 1.01 meters per second, which is just 10% lower than our calculated value. I would say this result is not bad at all. We got within 10% discrepancy between the theory and the experiment with very simple assumptions. As the investigation of the exact cause of this velocity discrepancy can quite likely take longer than this video, I will postpone it for another occasion. For now, let's just use the experimentally determined velocity of 1.01 meters per second. We can now address the third part of the calculation, which is the bounce. If the collision of the ball and the table were perfectly elastic, the ball would bounce back up with the same velocity as it had when hitting the table. However, we know that this is absolutely not the case, so let's model our post-collision velocity as w times the velocity before the collision, where w is the restitution coefficient. We'll model this parameter directly from our measurement, but initially let's set it to 1, to start with the elastic model. The rest of the calculation is similar to the previous case, and we get the following formula. But when we plot it, given the inelastic nature of the bounce, we get an overshoot. So let's decrease the value of the restitution coefficient. We can see that for a value of 0.77, we get a quite nice fit of the data. We can try to go even a step further and try to assume that the restitution coefficient stays the same also for the second bounce, which would mean that it is independent of the energy of the ball. The final formula and the trajectory look like this. Unfortunately, although quite close, we can see that we do not really describe well the last two data points. But this was reasonable to expect. Our intrinsic assumption that the restitution coefficient doesn't depend on the energy was quite bold. In fact, you can try yourselves to drop a ball from different heights and see how the first bounce compares to the later ones. Ok, let's sum up what we have learned from this example. First, idealizing the motion of the ball on the ramp got us the ball velocity within 10% of the measured value. In order to do better than that, we'd have to start including the second order effects such as the rolling resistance. 
Second, the fall from the ramp and the trajectory after the bounce look perfectly described by our equations. So I would dare to conclude that the air resistance can indeed be neglected. Third, the collision of the ball and the table is far from elastic. I would for now stop here and I would like to ask you if these findings were intuitive to you. Do you think that you can improve my calculations? In the description below I have included a link to the photos so you can try it yourselves. Also, what do you think, how can I improve on this experiment? Let me know in the comments. Thank you and bye bye!